I'm filming. Are you, you done yet? Hi everyone, Joel from Scalar Performance here. I'm one of the co-founders of Scalar Performance. And I'm gonna show you the thought process that we went through when we took the gas GR86 and we converted it to the SCR1 to be all electric. When we first looked at doing this, we wanted to pick a chassis that was familiar with everyone, with racers, easy to work on, and had a really easy access to as well. Not too expensive and really approachable. So when we came to the GR86, we actually started looking at the GT86. We looked at that car and it had a great history in racing. This model had just come out when we, when we started coming up with this idea. So it made sense to get the new chassis, new body style, and, and basically convert it to the electric platform that we wanted. So first step was we took one, bought it, had 106 kilometers on it, right off the showroom floor from Toyota, drove it to the shop, completely stripped it down. We 3D scanned it, we saw the kind of areas we had to work with, where we could put batteries, where we could put motors, where we could put the gearbox, gear reduction. There were so many ideas we had in our head on how we wanted to do things. So when you look at the platform, it's a rear wheel drive platform, the engine's in the front, the drive wheels are in the back. We thought about putting motor in the front through a transmission. You just lose efficiency that way. And for our use case that we wanted, which was a rolling start, uh, you're starting around 40 mile an hour with a top speed of about 120, 130 mile an hour. Having a gearbox wasn't really worth it. It took up a lot of space that we didn't need, caused a lot of drivetrain loss. And then you had a drive shaft running down the whole middle of the car that's using space that we could have used for batteries and that we did use for batteries. So we looked at it, we optimized space and we put the motor right on top of the subframe with a drop down to the gearbox, right to the rear wheels, all compact in the factory subframe. That left us a lot of space to go through the back seats, all the way up the transmission tunnel and into the front of the car where the engine bay was to keep the battery. It keeps the weight of the car very much between the front and rear axles, which is great for the balance of the car. One thing though with having all that massive battery that we need to build in between the front and rear axles. Now you're dealing with sheet metal in the car that wasn't designed to have a large box in the middle of it. So one of the big steps that we did with designing the battery and how it fit into the car was how do we avoid all of the structural areas of the car? Because you have frame rails that run down both, it's a unibody car, but you do have frame rail members that run down both sides of the car. Those are designed to take up impacts in your crashes. You look at the, how the body is shaped, and impacts that come in the front are absorbed through the frame rails and then down and distributed through different members of the unibody. We didn't want to interfere with any of those. In fact, we wanted to tie the battery into those. Because we're cutting out the transmission tunnel and the rear backseat area, those also have a structural component to the car. They tie all those frame rails together. So when we put the battery in it, we slid plates down each one of the frame rails and then bolt the battery in from the bottom up to those plates to then tie it all together with our skid plate, which is a quarter inch plate aluminum across the entire bottom of the car. So a lot of things that we had to go through designing several iterations of the battery in CAD. And then in our back room, we have probably three or four different actual battery cases that we made. And then we make it and we set it beside the car. And we're like, well, that's not gonna work because it looks great on computers. But then as soon as you build it and then you sit beside it and you can't move your arm because the battery is in such a spot that ergonomically it's just not comfortable and feasible to drive. So there's a lot of iterations that we had to go through to fit this battery pack. Probably the most difficult part of this car building it was how to fit this battery in a way that doesn't impede the driver space so that you are comfortable. Because when you're racing, let's be honest, being comfortable in the car as a driver and not feeling cramped, feeling free to move your arms and your legs, especially for somebody like me, I'm six foot seven. So I need a lot of space to move for legs and arms because I need a lot, of, a lot of real estate to move all myself around. So it was really important that we had a lot of that free moving space to be comfortable as a driver. We had talked about doing an offset battery to the passenger side, but then who, does, who doesn't want to take passengers if you have a race car? Obviously you're taking people out on the track to scare the crap out of them, <laughs> not just to have yourself as a single seater. Yeah, let's pop the hood and show some things under here. As you can see with the gas car, if you look at the engine placement uh, and where the front center line of the axle is, the engine's actually sitting almost completely in front of the wheels. So that is not good to have any weight outside of the front and rear axle. Um, you like to have all your weight as central as possible. So that's part of the reason why we kept the battery mostly in the back seat and down the transmission tunnel. It does come a little bit forward of the front axle center line, 
but we do have most of the weight out of the back. So that's an advantageous point of having a battery and we can place it wherever we want. Cut out very minimal amounts of material that didn't impede the structure of the car. Then tying the roll cage up into the front, which we did in our gas car as well, not only the gas, but the electric. Ties in the front strut towers too, so we maintain chassis rigidity up front. In both gas and electric, you'll notice that we're using the radiator from the gas car, also in the electric car. We have a PWR radiator up front on both vehicles um, to supply cooling for the gas car and for the electric. It's already ducted and everything up front to be cooling things up here, so we just basically repurposed the rad up front for cooling the battery and the inverter. So at the back of pretty much any gas car, you'll notice there's an exhaust back here. Underneath, you got the muffler, you have the tailpipes, you have your mid pipe that goes around the subframe. We don't have any of that on the electric car, so we are free to do whatever we want back here. You'll notice our diffuser comes up really nice and high. Uh, it ties into the flat bottom car that we have that is the battery pack. We can pretty much do whatever we want here. And we're actually gonna experiment with having some cooling come up through the trunk and have some arrow into the trunk to the back for cooling the motor. And also our inverter sits back here. The inverter is a little bit heavy. It's about 30 pounds. It is the only thing that's really sitting behind the axle, uh, as well as our dry sump oil tank. The motor is dry sump cooled and lubricated. So the tank sits back here near the back. Uh, that's really the only things that we have sitting outside the center line of the rear axle. So it keeps, again, all the weight is between either on the axle or between the axles to make for a great handling car. So standing underneath the gas car, one thing you'll notice is there is a lot of bumps and uneven surfaces. You have a transmission tunnel, you have exhaust coming through here. Wait, you have a lot of changing surfaces, a lot of different height levels of these different panels. So with the electric car, we turn this entire bottom into one big smooth flat piece. So that really allows you to have amazing arrow when you're setting up splitter and diffuser. It really makes them effective because all these uneven surfaces are areas that air can get turbulent. When the air is turbulent underneath the car, it's not giving you the full effect. You want a nice smooth stream of air underneath. So that's one thing that we really also focused on. You'll notice all the hardware on the electric car, all recessed hardware, everything's perfectly smooth. You have your splitter, all the splitter ramps, hardware, all recessed. So again, it's a perfectly smooth ride for that air from the front to the back, all the way to the diffuser to come up and have the most effect. As you can see with the gas and electric, there's quite some substantial differences. Continue us on our journey, like and follow us as we keep developing this car. Make changes, do more things to the prototype, keep breaking things and finding out how to make it better. Like and subscribe.